Okay, tonight is the 13th of August, 2011, and we are starting on the Kudaka Nikaya talks. Last night, we gave an introduction to the Kudaka Nikaya, and tonight we are going to start on the Udana. The Udana. This book uh, is the third book of the Kudaka Nikaya. And uh, the meaning of Udana is inspired utterances. So, this uh, suttas uh, consists of verses, uh, utterances of the Buddha, uh, and uh, also uh, some prose. Uh. So, this uh, Udana consists of uh, 80 suttas uh, divided into uh, 8 vagas. Uh. Vagas uh, can be called sections or chapters. La. So each vaga is ten, ten suttas. La. So there are eight vagas, so you have eighty uh, suttas. Mm. Uh, this Udana was first translated into English by D. M. Strong uh, in 1902. La. And then uh, later Woodward made another translation. And now the best translation we have at hand is by John Ireland. Uh, mm, later in the 6th century, uh, there was a commentary written on the Udana. Uh, it's written by Acharya Dhammapala uh, called the Paramatta Dipani. Uh, okay, now we start with the uh, first sutta. Uh, so the first Vaga chapter uh, we are starting is called the Bodhi Vaga. And the first Sutta is called the Patama Bodhi Sutta, the Bodhi tree. Uh, the first Bodhi, uh, the Sutta and the first Bodhi tree. Thus have I heard. At one time the Lord was staying at Uruvela beside the river Naranjara at the foot of the Bodhi tree, having just realized full enlightenment. At that time, the Lord sat cross-legged for seven days, experiencing the bliss of liberation. Then at the end of those seven days, the Lord emerged from that concentration and gave well-reasoned attention during the first watch of the night to dependent arising in forward order thus. This being that comes to be, from the arising of this, that arises, that is, with ignorance as condition, Volition comes to be. With volition as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, mentality and materiality comes to be. With mentality and materiality as condition, the sixfold base comes to be. With the sixfold base as condition, contact comes to be. With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. With craving as condition, Grasping comes to be. With grasping as condition, being comes to be. With being as condition, birth comes to be. With birth as condition, aging and dying, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair come to be. This is the origin of this whole mass of suffering. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. When states become manifest to the ardent meditating Brahmana, all his doubts then vanish since he understands each state along with its cause. Stop here for a moment. So, uh, you, you see from the first paragraph, uh, the Buddha uh, contemplated uh, a rising of dependent origination during the first watch of the night, that means from 10, uh, from 6 p.m. until 10 p.m., for four hours, uh, he saw how uh, conditions or states uh, arise, uh, depending on conditions. Uh. And for uh, in the Vinaya books, uh, this was stated, uh, the first watch, 6 to 10 p.m., he contemplated the arising of dependent origination. Then the second watch, or middle watch, from 10 p.m. until 2 a.m., he contemplated the uh, cessation of dependent origination. 
And then the third watch, uh, from 2 to 6 a.m., uh, he contemplated the arising and ceasing of dependent origination. So, you see, uh, for the Buddha to, act, to really understand dependent origination in depth, uh, he has to contemplate for so many hours, uh, 12 hours, uh, to really understand, uh, even after he was enlightened. Uh, as I men- mentioned before, uh, the Buddha doesn't automatically know everything. He has to make the effort uh, to contemplate, then only he will know. Uh, so the verses, uh, when things come to manifest, become manifest, uh, actually it's not a good translation. It is Dhamma. When Dhamma becomes manifest, Dhamma can refer to the states. Uh, states meaning here like ignorance, volition, consciousness, etc. Uh, to the ardent meditating Brahmana. This word Brahmana I mentioned before, there are two meanings. Originally the word Brahmana refers to uh, the renunciants, the renunciants, the caste of renunciants uh, were called Brahmanas. And these renunciants, because they, uh, these caste, uh, all of the men, uh, they have to renounce sometime or other, uh, become uh, uh, recluse, uh, beg for their food and all that. Uh. And uh, but later, after the uh, after some time, uh, because some of them uh, attain psychic power, they co- could communicate with the devas and all that. Uh. They learn mantras, uh, words of power. Uh. Mantras are very powerful words. Uh. To us, they have no meaning, but. Uh, uh, you can do magical things with them, lah. Like walk through the wall, become invisible, and all that, lah. So, as I mentioned before, uh, to uh, do black magic, you can use mantras. To counter black magic, also you can use mantras. Uh, to uh, keep spirits, uh, control spirits, also they use mantras. Lah. So these mantras are not the Buddha's teachings. They came from this Brahmanism. So, the Brahmins, they only transmitted these mantras to their fellow Brahmins, those of the same caste. Then, later, because of greed, they sold their secrets away. And also, because they knew these mantras, the kings used to employ them as advisors. And then they were given property, they were given wives and uh, all that. Nah. So later they uh, stopped uh, becoming uh, renunciants. Lah. So later, because they are no more renunciants, they are called Brahmins lah, instead of Brahmana. So the word Brahmana in Pali uh, can refer either to a holy man or to the Brahmin caste. Lah. Yeah. So when it refers to the holy man, uh, I will use Brahmana. Lah. When it refers to the Brahmin caste as of today, and we will call him a Brahmin. So here, to the ardent meditating Brahmana, meaning the holy man, all his doubts then vanish. Okay, the second sutta is called Dutya Bodhi Sutta. The second Bodhi Sutta. Thus have I heard. At one time, the Lord was staying at Uruvela for seven days experiencing the bliss of liberation. Then at the end of those seven days, the Lord emerged from that concentration and gave well-reasoned attention during the middle watch of the night to dependent arising in reverse order thus. This not being, that comes not to be. From the cessation of this, that ceases. That is, from the cessation of of ignorance, volition ceases. From the cessation of volition, consciousness ceases. From the cessation of consciousness, mentality and materiality ceases. From the cessation of mentality and materiality, the sixfold base ceases. From the cessation of the sixfold base, contact ceases. From the cessation of contact, feeling ceases. From the cessation of feeling, cravings ceases. From the cessation of craving, grasping ceases. From the cessation of grasping, being ceases. From the cessation of being, birth ceases. From the cessation of birth, aging and dying, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair cease. This is the ceasing of this whole mass of suffering. 
Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. When states become manifest to the ardent meditating Brahmana, all his doubts then vanish since he has known the utter destruction of conditions. Chaya conditions. Uh, so, okay. Now we come to the third sutta, 1.3. Tatya Bodhi Sutta, the third Bodhi Sutta. Thus have I heard. At one time the Lord was staying at Uruvela for seven days, experiencing the bliss of liberation. That at the end of those seven days, the Lord gave well-reasoned attention, or careful attention, during the last watch of the night, to dependent arising in both forward and reverse order. Thus, this being that comes to be, from the arising of this, that arises. This not being, that comes not to be. From the cessation of this, that ceases. That is, with ignorance as condition, volition comes to be, etc. Uh, and then from the complete disappearance and cessation of, lib- of ignorance, volition ceases, etc., etc. Uh, then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. When states become manifest to the ardent meditating Brahmana, he abides scattering Mara's host like the sun illumining the sky. That's the end of the sutta. So, um, so these three suttas concern dependent origination. Is there anything to discuss here? Anything to discuss? Yeah. Uh, the most important is uh, feeling because at feeling uh, if you're not careful uh, then uh, craving arises uh, so you have to be uh, you have to uh, cut off craving uh, as uh, the Noble Eightfold Path uh, it is stated uh, to end suffering. Uh, the origin of suffering is craving uh, and to end uh, uh, suffering uh, you have to totally let go of uh, craving. Uh. So craving comes from feelings. Uh, so you have to always observe your feelings. Uh, know that they are impermanent that you cannot uh, hold on to them. Uh. So if you crave, uh, if feeling arises and you crave, uh, you know uh, you're not going to get it forever. Uh, and so uh, uh, when you understand the Dhamma, then you let go. Uh. Uh, uh, where? Uh, uh, this is the cessation of the whole mass of suffering. Isn't it? Mm. So, uh, that is uh, when a person uh, attains uh, arahanhood, liberation, then he uh, uh, the greed, hatred, and delusion has ceased. Uh, the most uh, the, the 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 most uh, uh, basic uh, is ignorance la, when you understand the dhamma. But ignorance also has many levels. When, for example, you cut off one quarter of the ignorance. Eh, then you become a Sotapanna. You cut off two quarters, you might become a Sakadagamin. Cut off three quarters, Sanagamin. You cut off all la, ignorance, then you become an Arahan. So there are different levels. La. See, there's no mind. Uh, 
when they say there's no mind, probably they mean uh, there's no self behind the working of the mind. Uh. Uh, generally, Zen Buddhism, they are trying to see uh, there's no self. Uh. So, when they say no mind, uh, should be there's no, no self behind the mind. Uh. I come to Sutta 1.4, Nigroda Sutta. Nigroda refers to the banyan tree. That's what I heard. At one time, the Lord was staying at Uruvela, beside the river Naranjara, beneath the goat herd's banyan tree, having just realized full enlightenment. At that time, the Lord sat cross-legged for seven days, experiencing the bliss of liberation. And when those seven days had elapsed, the Lord emerged from that concentration. Then a certain haughty Brahmin approached the Lord. Having approached, he exchanged polite greetings with him and stood to one side. Standing there, that Brahmin said to the Lord, How good Gotama is one a Brahmana, and what are the things that make one a Brahmana? Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. A Brahmana is one who has discarded, has discarded evil states not haughty, free from stains, self-control, perfect in knowledge, one who has lived the holy life. He might rightly use the word Brahma, who has no swellings or heaps uh, or pile-ups uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, this uh, Brahma refers to uh, God, in the Indian tradition, Brahma refers to the creator God. And the caste, Brahmana, is supposed to be a relative of Brahma, born from Brahma's head. So this swellings, or pile-ups, or heaps up, the Pali word is usada. The commentary says, refers to passion, Hatred, delusion, uh, conceit, and views, uh, whether it's true or not, I'm uh, not so sure. Uh, some of the things the commentary says are uh, okay, some are not. Uh. Now we come to 1.5. Tera Sutta. Thus have I heard. At one time, the Lord was staying near Savati in the Jeta wood at Anatha Pindika's monastery. At that time, the Venerable Sariputta, the Venerable Maha Mogalana, the Venerable Maha Kasapa, the Venerable Maha Kachayana, the Venerable Maha Kotita, the Venerable Maha Kapina, the Venerable Maha Chunda, the Venerable Anuruddha, the Venerable Revata, and the Venerable Nanda were approaching the Lord, seeing those Venerable Ones coming. The Lord said to the monks, Those are Brahmanas who are coming, monks. Those are Brahmanas who are coming. When this was said, a certain monk who was a Brahmin by birth asked the Lord, how revered, sir, is one a Brahmana? And what are the things that make one a Brahmana? Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. Those who have expelled evil states and who fare ever mindful, the awakened ones who have destroyed the fetters, they are the Brahmanas in the world. So these uh, monks who are coming to see the Buddha, they are all the senior uh, disciples of the Buddha, la, all Arahansa, famous Arahansa. That's why the Buddha said, uh, look who is coming. These are really holy men, la, Brahmanas. La. Uh, now we come to 1.6. Maha Kasapa Sutta. Thus have I heard. At one time the Lord was staying near Rajagaha in the bamboo wood at the squirrel's feeding place. At that time the Venerable Maha Kasapa while staying in the Pipali cave, became sick, afflicted, grievously ill. Then after a while, the Venerable Maha Kasapa recovered from that sickness and thought, what if I should enter Rajagaha for alms food? At that time, 500 devatas were busily preparing alms food for the Venerable Maha Kasapa. But having refused the offerings of those 500 devatas, the Venerable Maha Kasapa robed himself in the forenoon and taking his bowl and outer cloak, entered Rajagaha for alms food. 
going to those streets occupied by the poor and needy, the streets of the weavers. Now the Lord saw the venerable Maha Kasapa in Rajagaha walking for alms food in those streets occupied by the poor and needy, the streets of the weavers. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance, not supporting another and unknown, controlled, set firm in the essential, with asavas destroyed and rid of faults, him I call a Brahmana. It's the end of this. Uh, this uh, Venerable Maha Kasapa, uh, he was sick. Uh, so when he recovered, uh, 500 devas came to, to offer him food, uh, but he refused their food in the cave. Uh, uh, he prefers to go on uh, begging arms round. So also he likes to go to the poor people uh, because he's not fussy about his food. Uh, uh, and he wants to give these people a chance uh, to get a lot of blessings. Uh. These people are much in need of blessings. Uh. Uh, that's why sometimes a lot of, some people, uh, when they see the monk go on arms round, uh, they think uh, the monk has so much food, why does he still want to go and beg for uh, food? Uh? Or the monastery is well supported, why does he have to go and beg for food? You don't understand, uh, this uh, is actually giving people the chance to do merit. Uh, uh, and uh, as Ajahn Chah says, uh, that uh, people, most uh, uh, lay people, uh, they need to uh, make offerings. Uh, they need to make offerings, otherwise uh, they may not have enough uh, merit uh, to go for a good rebirth. Uh, so monks go on arms round. Uh, is uh, showing compassion uh, to lay people uh, by giving them a chance to offer food. Uh, uh, a lot of pe lay people uh, who, don't under who don't know the Dhamma, uh, they don't understand this. 1.7 Ajakala Paka Sutta That's what I heard. At one time the Lord was staying at Pava in the Ajakala Paka Shrine the dwelling place of the Yaka, Ajakala Paka. It happened that the Lord was seated in the open air on the pitch black night while it was gently raining. Then the Yaka, Ajakala Paka, desiring to cause fear and consternation in the Lord and to make his hair stand on end, approached the Lord and close to him emitted three times a terrifying cry, saying, That is a goblin for you, recluse. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. When a Brahmana has gone beyond in states pertaining to himself, then he has surpassed the reach of this goblin and his noisy din. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So you see sometimes if a monk stays alone huh, in a cave or in the deep forest, huh, some of these uh, spirits... Huh, they are mischievous. La. They like to just frighten you for the fun of it. Yeah. So unless uh, you have good samadhi, uh, don't go and try to be brave. Uh, go and stay in these uh, places, uh, especially alone. La. Uh, you might get uh, uh, deranged la, from fear. 1.8 Sangamaji Sutta Thus have I heard. At one time, the Lord was staying near Savati in the Jeta wood in Anatha Pindika's monastery. On that occasion, the Venerable Sangamaji had arrived at Savati to see the Lord. The former wife of the Venerable, of the Venerable Sangamaji, hearing that Master Sangamaji had arrived at Savati, took her child and went to the Jeta wood. Now, at that time, the Venerable Sangamaji was sitting at the foot of a certain tree to rest during the middle of the day. Then the former wife of the Venerable Sangamaji approached him and spoke these words, I have a little son, recluse, support me. When this was said, the Venerable Sangamaji remained silent. A second time and a third time she said, I have a little son, recluse, support me. And a third time the Venerable Sangamaji remained silent. Then the former wife of the Venerable Sangamaji put the child down in front of him and went away saying, this is your son, recluse. Support him. But the Venerable Sangamaji neither looked at the child nor spoke to him. Then the former wife of the Venerable Sangamaji, having gone a short distance, looked back 
and saw that he was neither looking at the child nor speaking to him. On seeing this, she thought, this recluse does not even want his son. She returned, took the child and went away. With the divine eye which is purified and superhuman, the Lord saw the discourteous behavior on the part of the venerable Sangamaji's wife. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. He had no pleasure in her coming, nor grief when she went away. Sangamaji, free from ties, him I call a Brahmana. Uh, this sutta is quite interesting. Huh? So, maybe when uh, this venerable Sangamaji left home, uh, uh, he didn't know maybe that the wife was pregnant. Uh, maybe after one or two years he came back. And this uh, wife wanted him to support, nah? but uh, he had already become a uh, arahan. Nah? And when a person becomes an uh, arahan, nah? the old self has died. Nah? Uh, he cannot go back home. Nah? So his behavior nah, to ordinary people nah, is uh, like a heartless. Nah? His own son, nah? so he won't bother to look, he won't uh, bother to talk. He probably, yeah, if, this, if the wife left the son there, probably he would have walked away. Nah? Arahan's uh, behavior, uh, normal human beings uh, find uh, uh, hard to understand. Mm. 1.9, Jatila Sutta. Jatila are the type of uh, uh, matted hair ascetics. Uh. Thus have I heard, at one time the Lord was staying near Gaia on Gaia's head. At that time, during the cold winter nights between the eights in the season of the snowfall, many Jatila ascetics at Gaia were plunging in and out of the water, pouring water over themselves and performing the fire sacrifice, thinking that by these practices, purity is obtained. The Lord saw those Jatila ascetics plunging in and out of the water, pouring water over themselves and performing the fire sacrifice. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance, not by water is one cleansed. Many people bathe in this. In whom is truth and Dhamma, he is cleansed. He is a Brahmana. These Jatilas, uh, they are matted hair ascetics. And some of them, uh, they practice Samatha meditation and attain the Jhanas. Uh. So we find the Vinaya books uh, that uh, the Buddha went to a group of these Jatilas uh, who were like this. Uh, they they uh, plunge themselves uh, into the river water uh, early in the morning, I think before sunrise, and late in the, uh, in the evening uh, when the sun sets. Uh, they think by doing that, uh, they wash away the river, wash away their sins. Uh, and also they worship fire, uh, they keep the fire burning all the time. Uh, uh. So the Buddha went to these uh, Jatilas uh, and uh, impressed them with his psychic power until they became his disciples, uh, 1,000 of them. And the Buddha preached to them the Adita Pariyaya Sutta, the fire discourse. Uh. He used fire because they they worship fire, they, they, they think highly of fire. Uh. So when the Buddha talked about fire, uh, they paid attention. And just speaking that one sutta, 1,000 of them became enlightened, became arahants. So these are probably different different groups of jatilas. 1.10, Bahya Sutta. Bahya is a ascetic. His name is Bahya Daruchirya. Daruchirya means the bark cloth. So it's called Bahya of the bark cloth. Thus have I heard. At one time, the Lord was staying near Savati in the Jeta wood at Anatha Pindika's monastery. At that time, Bahia of the bark cloth was living by the seashore at Suparaka. He was respected, revered, honored, venerated, and given homage. and was one who obtained the requisites of arms, of robes, arms, food, lodging, and medicines. Now, while he was in seclusion, this reflection arose in the mind of Bahia Daruchiriya. Am I one of those in the world who are arahans or have entered the path to arahanship? Then a devata, who was a former blood relation of Bahia of the bark cloth, understood that reflection in his mind. Being compassionate and wishing to benefit him, he approached Bahia and said, You, Bahia, are neither an arahan or have you entered the path to arahan, 
put or arahanship. You do not follow that practice whereby you could be an arahan or enter the path to arahanship. Stop it for a moment. Uh, you see the fact that he can see the deva and talk to the deva, uh, probably uh, he has attained the fourth jhana. Uh, uh, so he has some psychic power. Uh, that's probably why he thought he was an arahan. Uh, sometimes uh, ascetics, uh, when they practice until they attain psychic power, uh, they uh, make the mistake of thinking they are already enlightened. Uh. Then he asked the deva, then in the world, including the devas, who are arahans? or have entered the path to arhatship. And the deva replied, There is Bahia, in a far country, a town called Savati. There the Lord now lives, who is Arahan, Samasambuddha. That Lord Bahia is indeed an Arahan, and he teaches Dhamma for the realization of arhatship. Then Bahia of the bark cloth, profoundly stirred by the words of that devata, then and there departed for Suparaka, Stopping only for one night everywhere along the way, he went to Savati where the Lord was staying in the Jeta wood at Anatha Pindika's monastery. Stop here for a moment. Huh? So here he says, huh? he uh, traveled non-stop, huh? only at night, huh? every night huh? he will stop huh? to rest, huh? otherwise he traveled non-stop. But according to the commentary, he traveled a distance, huh? a long distance of a hundred and 20 yojanas, that means 1,200 kilometers uh, in one night. Uh, uh, this is just a guess, I guess. Hmm. At that time, a number of monks were walking up and down in the open air. Then Bahia of the bark, bark cloth approached those monks and said, Where revered sirs is the Lord now living, the Arahan Samasambuddha? We wish to see that Lord who is the Arahan Samasambuddha. And they said, the Lord Bahia has gone for alms food among the houses. Then Bahia hurriedly left the Jeta wood. Entering Savati, he saw the Lord walking for alms food in Savati, pleasing, lovely to see, with calm senses and tranquil mind, attained to perfect poise and calm, controlled, a perfected one, watchful with restrained senses. On seeing the Lord, he approached, fell down with his head at the Lord's feet and said, Teach me Dhamma, Lord. Teach me Dhamma Sugata, so that it will be for my good and happiness for a long time. Upon being spoken to thus, the Lord said to Bahia of the bark cloth, It is unsuitable time, Bahia. We have entered among the houses for alms food. A second time, Bahia said to the Lord, It is difficult to know for certain, revered sir, how long the Lord will live, or how long I will live. Teach me Dhamma, Lord. Teach me Dhamma Sugata so that it will be for my good and happiness for a long time. A second time, the Lord said to Bahia, It is unsuitable time, Bahia. We have entered among the houses for alms food. A third time, Bahia said to the Lord, It is difficult to know for certain, revered sir, how long the Lord will live or how long I will live. Teach me Dhamma, Lord. Teach me Dhamma, Sugata, so that it will be for my good and happiness for a long time. Then the Buddha said, Bahia, herein you should train yourself thus. In the seen will be merely what is seen. In the heard will be merely what is heard. In the sense will be merely what is sensed. In the cognized will be merely what is cognized. In this way you should train yourself, Bahia. When Bahia, for you in the seen is merely what is seen. In the cognized is merely what is cognized. Then Bahia, you will not be with that. When Bahia, you are not with that. Then Bahia, you will not be in that. When Bahia, you are not in that. Then Bahia, you will neither be here nor beyond, nor in between the two. Just this is the end of suffering. Now through this brief Dharma teaching of the Lord, the mind of Bahia of the bark cloth was immediately freed from the asavas without grasping. Then the Lord, having instructed Bahia with this brief instruction, went away. Not long after the Lord's departure, a cow with a young calf attacked Bahia of the bark cloth and killed him. When the Lord, having walked for alms food in Savati, was returning from the alms round with a number of monks, on departing from the town, he saw that Bahia of the bark cloth had died. Seeing this, he said to the monks, Monks, Take Bahia's body, put it on a litter, carry it away and burn it, and make a stupa for it. Your companion in the holy life has died. 
very well revered sir, said those monks. Those monks replied to the Lord. Taking Bahia's body, they put it upon a litter, carried it away and burnt it, and made a stupa for it. Then they went to the Lord, prostrated themselves, and sat down to one side. Sitting there, those monks said to the Lord, Bahia's body has been burned, revered sir, and a stupa has been made for it. What is his destiny? What is his future birth? And the Buddha said, Monks, Bahia of the bark cloth was a wise man. He practiced according to Dhamma and did not trouble me by disputing about Dhamma. Monks, Bahia of the bark cloth has attained final Nibbana. Then on realizing its significance, the Lord uttered on that occasion this inspired utterance. When neither water nor yet earth, nor fire nor wind gain a foothold, there gleam no stars, no sun sheds light, there shines no moon, yet there no darkness reigns. When a sage, a brahmana, has come to know this for himself through his own wisdom, then he is freed from form and formless, freed from pleasure and from pain. This inspired utterance was spoken by the Lord also. So did I hear. This sutta also is quite interesting. We see this Bahia when uh, after giving uh, instruction to him, uh, uh, is mentioned in some 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 other place, lah. Maybe in uh, in another book. Uh, I'm not sure where. Maybe in the Dhammapada commentary or something, lah. That uh, he asked to be ordained, and then the Buddha said, uh, uh, that he has to look for a. Uh, bowl, uh, probably he already got ropes. And when he went to look for a bowl, uh, then this, this cow uh, attacked him. Normally these cows, uh, when they have a young calf beside them, uh, they are very protective. Uh. So you happen to walk near, uh, especially if you wear a yellow cloth like this, uh, it looks like the tiger color, uh, then they will attack. Uh. Uh, so that's why some monks, uh, out of ignorance, uh, no experience, huh? uh, they don't notice huh? when there's a cow, huh? you have to be very careful, huh? you have to see whether there's a baby beside, huh? if there's a baby, you have to stay very clear. Uh, so some monks have died huh? or injured huh? from this. Huh? So this um, Bahia, huh? because he probably had attained the fourth jhana, huh? the Buddha gave him this brief teaching and he became enlightened. Huh? Uh, so he's the uh, Fasters uh, who attain enlightenment uh, just by one uh, teaching like this, uh, the fastest monk to become enlightened. Uh, without the four jhanas, uh, it's impossible for him uh, to become enlightened so fast. Uh. So the, the Buddha said, uh, 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 in the scene will be merely the scene, uh, in the herd, etc. Uh, then, if, if for, for you in the scene is, when for you in the scene is merely what is seen, uh, in the herd is what is the herd, what is herd, etc. Then you will not be with that. When you are not with that, then you will not be in that. And then you will be neither here nor beyond. So, uh, so the Buddha is telling him, uh, whenever the six sense objects uh, appear in your consciousness, uh, uh, don't think about it. Uh, and also in the some other place and uh, the suttas, the Buddha said, don't take note of the major and minor features. Lah. For example, you see somebody, you think oh, this person is handsome or beautiful, etc. Uh, uh, then, uh, then you just know is this an object uh, in your consciousness. Uh, then, not with that means uh, the object is not in relation with you, lah, with the I. Lah. Uh, if you you are with that, uh, you form a relationship with it. Uh. For example, you see somebody and you think you don't like him, and then you think I hate him. Then the I arises and the him arises. Uh. Uh, but if it's just an object, uh. and that's why usually the Buddha says guarding the six sense doors. Uh. Anything comes up in our six senses, since the six sense doors, uh, we don't pay too much attention. Uh. Instead, uh, we divert our attention uh, to only four objects. Uh. Body, feelings, mind, and dhamma. Uh, the six sense uh, objects uh, are the bait of Mara, uh, always trying to uh, bait us, uh, uh, something attractive. Uh, uh. So, when we are not in that, uh, just now I said uh, in that meaning, uh, you form a relationship with it. Uh, uh, 
if you are not in that, nah, then you are not in that world, nah, that world of the sight, sound, smell, taste, etc. Nah. Then you are neither here in this world nor in another world. Nah. So if you are not in this world or in another world, you are in your mind. Nah. Uh, then you are neither here nor beyond. Uh, then that is the end of suffering. Uh, basically. Uh, uh, then the Buddha, finally, I uh, talk about this state uh, of parinibbana, uh, cessation of consciousness, uh, where there is no water, there is no earth, there is no fire, no air or wind. Uh, the, the four elements, uh, the physical world does not exist there. Uh, uh, there are no stars and no sun. Uh, even though there are no stars, no no sun and no moon, uh, yet it is not dark. Uh, no darkness reigns. Uh. The Buddha says uh, in the Kevada Sutta, Tiga Nikaya number 11, which we went through, uh, in that state, uh, uh, consciousness is uh, luminous, uh, bright uh, and boundless, uh, but it has no object. Uh, in the normal six consciousness, uh, every time you have consciousness, there must be an object. But in that uh, state of cessation of consciousness. Uh, uh, it's a different type of consciousness uh, which has no object. Uh. Uh, okay, anything to discuss before we go to chapter 2? Um, what is Sugata? Sugata. Uh, what is Sugata? Uh, well gone one, I think. Su is good, nah. Good data is gone. Well gone one. There are different translations, lah. Different people translate it differently. Hmm. Yes, the Buddha said four persons are worthy of a stupa. La. And uh, uh, these four persons, first is a Samasambuddha, uh, uh, second is a Pacheka Buddha, the third is a Aryan disciple, la. and the fourth is a universal king, la, universal monarch, la, one who rules the earth, the whole world by Dhamma. La. So these four persons are uh, are virtuous, la. and uh, uh, after they pass away, the Buddha says you can cremate them and take their sharira. Sharira is just their bones, la, their relics, la. and then uh, uh, make a stupa and put there for people to pay respect. La. Uh, 